I am so grateful and humbled by the folks that we have here today. We have um, two individuals who are going to speak to you. Um, some of one of whose sacrifice really initiated the civil rights movement on so many levels and really brought it to fruition, not only within the United States, but really helped us recognize just the ugliness behind racism and what it could, what the potential of, of it is. And so we're going to talk a little bit, and you're going to hear her story. Um, and the other individual who we jokingly introduce each other as cousins is, uh, huh? Primo, primos, we call each other primos because he speaks Spanish too, um, is Glenn Ellis. And he is the, the only, um, the only African American um, bioethics fellow currently in the School of Medicine at Harvard. He's also the only um, African American who has a syndicated column on African American health that's published nationwide. And the only African American who has a syndicated radio show nationwide that you can pick up on African American health. So he, he's just done a phenomenal job. But I forgot to introduce myself because I'm so excited. So um, my name is Britt Rio Sellis. I'm the founding dean of the College of Health Sciences and Human Services. And when I started this five years ago, I really did so because I wanted our students to have access to the same level of speakers that Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, all of the other schools. And perhaps more importantly, I wanted our students to see themselves in incredible nationwide renowned or sometimes international and nationally renowned role models so that they could really imagine themselves in these individuals and really see what can be done. Because I know, you know, we are in a time of a lot of discord and a lot of static, right? And we really need to keep our focus on what health and wellness and what we need to do to socially create a much better, more evolved world. Um, so five years ago we started the diversity celebration series within the college. You know, sometimes we got 10 people, sometimes we got 15, and I'm so happy to say that for the past two years we just have had bumper groups of students and there's been a lot more interest not only within the College of Health Sciences and Human Services, but also within our external advisory board, within our donor base, and with students across colleges. So I'm, I'm really, really pleased about that. And I want to introduce, and we also have folks filming today, so I'm very, very grateful that you're here because I think, I, I feel that what we're doing with this series is historic, and it's a first for CSUMB, and um, it's something that uh, I would love to commemorate. So you're giving us that opportunity, so thank you so much. So there's a few very special people that I want to introduce in, in the audience before we get started. Um, I want to introduce Jerry Griffin and Carolyn Griffin right here. So Dr. Jerry Griffin is one of our external advisory board members and he's also, his history is just absolutely incredible, both as a physician and someone who has worked actively in combat and caring for folks and making sure they survive under the most horrendous conditions. So Jerry, thank you so much. our friends from um, Salinas Valley. So Salinas Valley is so important to me because when I went to Pete Delgado, who's the CEO, and said, I really want to start this diversity celebration series, but I need help and I need funding, he said, absolutely, what do you need? So Salinas Valley has always been our forefront. When I absolutely need some funds to get something started, Pete is the first person I call. So that might be a good thing for him or a bad thing, but he's always been with me, so I really appreciate it. So thank you. Way, way back in the corner, and um, right now he's not. Okay, there you go. Brian. So, Dr. Brian Corpening, can you please stand up? Our newly found, and we're very blessed to have So, thank you, Brian, for coming. And I'm trying to think of who else is in this crowd. We've also got some wonderful professors. Nina, who's with us here, and Dr. Nina Tsai, who's here, and this is Dr. Raimundo Kaldai, who leads our Health, Human Services, and Public Policy Department. And Dr. Vanessa Lopez-Littleton, who leads our college of the only Social Media, so she leads that. And Dr. 
Dr. Stephen Padgett, who's, act, who's actually a member of that. I also want to introduce you to Dr. Veronica Chukuameka, who's in charge of all of our, our IR data, so our institutional oh. research. And Brenda Cook, who helps me with development. So if any of you ever win the lottery, I want you to talk to her, because she will help you spend it. So thank you all so very much. And so I want to introduce, formally introduce, so um, the folks that we have here today. So first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about Sarah Collins Rudolph. Um, how many people have heard of Sarah Collins before the announcement? I want everybody to be honest, because it's okay if you haven't, right? I think you have now. How many people have heard of Sarah Collins Rudolph before the event today? How many people, when you saw her name and read the description, looked her up real fast? Okay, there's a bunch more hands going up. So Sarah Collins Rudolph, Spike Lee, and I love Spike Lee, but he made a big mistake when he left you out early. So I just want to say that. That's just going to be, I'm going to put that out. He, he wrote, he did a movie called Four Girls, The Four Little Girls. And that movie was about the bombing that occurred in September 1963 at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Well, there were actually five girls in the bathroom in the ladies' lounge at the church that day. And one of them is Sarah Collins Rudolph. So you will see her, She's, you can find her on Democracy Now!, you can find her on, um, if you just Google her name, you'll find her presenting at Penn State and all kinds of other universities. And this is the first time she's been in Central California. So we are so grateful to have you here. We hope that this isn't the last time that you'll be here. So I want everybody to give a big otter welcome to Sarah about our second speaker because I really believe magic happens so I went back so I've known Glenn for about 10 years now we work together on the National Health Only Disparity. 12. We, you're only 12. <laughs> you're only 12 but I'm only 10. So we work on the National Conference on Health Disparities together so we see each other we see each other and this last summer I was at Bryn Mawr doing a training for women in higher education leadership and I walk into the hotel I have to stay the first night in the hotel before I'm moving to the dorms and this guy checks me and he goes, wow, your last name's Ellis. And I said, yeah. And, and I, he said, wow, so is mine. And I said, you know, I have a really, really great friend and colleague who does amazing work on African-American health. Um, he's just fantastic. You know, I don't know if you know much about him, but he's written this book and he has a radio show and he has a syndicated column and I'm going on and on, this guy's just nodding. He goes, yeah, that's my dad. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, so we got to spend some time together in his hometown, not at our conference site, and he's just doing amazing work. And I'm so happy because his book just came out in Spanish. And I, can I brag a little bit? Yeah. I translated back. So I'm really, really happy about that. So, and also, I want to introduce George Rudolph, who is Sarah's life, love, and supporter. And uh, just couldn't have, I was talking to them last night about where they met and how they came together. And, you know, there's just very few couples where you can see the love just, it's just all right there. So, George, really wanted to have you. So, and I know I'm forgetting people, and I'm sorry, but, but I, I do want to get us started. And um, and I know it's a little warm. We turned off the fire. We opened the back door, right? Is everybody okay? I know we're sitting a little cozy. If anybody needs water, tea, lemonade, whatever, you can get it. But um, so I want to start today with uh, Glenn. So Glenn, can you come on up and get us started? So he says he's going to write another book. I said, come back, stay with us, write the book, right? <laughs> if you come back, i got a room for you for free. Gotcha. No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> you want to get to it? Or you want to be pretty? I'm pretty, I'm, I'm real close. Okay. <laughs> I'm real close. Sarah, I'm real close. Family might drop out. Yeah, family might drop out. Family might drop out. Well, second night, I got you. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. How, can everybody hear me? I don't need the mic, right? Everybody can hear me? Yeah. Okay. 
So, um, no, I'm good. Um, if I have one, I'll talk longer than I want so you have to trust me. <laughs> so anyway, I just want to say thank you and good evening to everybody. And um, we are just honored that you thought enough to come out to be a part of this event tonight. And I clearly have to thank my dear cousin and her family, Enrique, and uh, the staff, this university, this community for welcoming us and making us feel welcome. Because we felt nothing but welcome from the time we got here. That's right. Have we? Amen. All right. So, <laughs> so uh, that means a lot. And so before we get started, I have two requests, and uh, I need you all to work with me. Now, the first thing I need to ask with all due respect, is there anybody in this room over 60 years old? <laughs> is there anybody in this room over 70 years old? I see two hands. Do I see three hands? Is there anybody in this room over 72 years old? Is there anybody in this room over 75 years old? Oops. <laughs> Soul to the bands in 75. So, uh, first I just need to let you know that we cannot do this until the first. As the elders, that is okay. And you have your permission to proceed with this program. Yes, sir. Uh, right. It's impossible to do it. Try to do something in life without acknowledging. The next thing I need to do, we're going to get started. I need to ask each one of you to think about an ancestor of yours that comes to your heart. And I'm going to count to three, and I need everybody to say the name out loud of that ancestor. One, two, three. Sure. So, the ancestors are with us. We have the permission of the elders. So we're going to get started. So, um, and that's not a dog and pony show. That's how I live. So I just need to be clear about that. So um, this is um, an honor. And I want to try to, I'm going to, this only be a few minutes because the most important thing is to hear Sarah Collins Rudolph's story from her mouth. Until the lion gets his own storytelling, the story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. That's right. You can go to somebody's panel, den, with all kinds of heads from trophies and animals on the wall. And they'll see this lion head up there and they'll talk about how in the dark of night, in deepest Tanzania, there was this lion hunt going on. And out of nowhere, this lion leaped at him and he, just before he could get the shot, just as he was about to get it off, the lion was jumping over him and he barely squeezed the trigger before the lion's dead body fell on top of him. And he pushed it off. But if the lion had his own storytellers, you might find out that the lion was asleep taking a nap. <laughs> and he got Somebody walked up behind him while he was asleep and shot him in the back of the head. But if the lion has nobody to tell their story, then the story you hear will be the only thing you know. So we're grateful and we're honored and we're blessed. And I'm extremely blessed because this is she's my friend and uh, they, these are people I love and their family. So I'm not, this we are witnessing. We've had a few opportunities. Dante and a couple other folks throughout the journey of being here. I said, hey, listen, your grandchildren will look at you and think you're lying when you show them, tell them you met Sarah Collins Rudolph personally 30, 40, 50 years from now. And have a picture of it that will be in your family for the next two or three generations. But they won't believe it. So this is living history that we have an opportunity because of the incident that changed this whole society. But anyway, I digress. A little bit. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of do some a, a brief little presentation, and it's not going to be direct to what you see on the screen, so bear with me. Um, 
So, I, you know, most of this is Black History Month, and I've had a little experience being black. <laughs> Been a black baby. <laughs> had all those experiences as a black baby. I was a black boy. <laughs> And this was the Christmas when I wanted to be a cowboy. And my mother got me a cowboy outfit. Everything. Hat, I had the glove, I mean the boots, the belt with the big buckle, the little scarf, the little kerchief. I mean everything. And I'm going through the packages and I'm saying, well, Mom, where's the gun? And she's like, you ain't got no gun. Mom, <laughs> like, I can't go outside. I'm a cowboy. I ain't got a gun. They'll laugh at me. She said, if you need a gun, to be able to determine who you are, you need to think about being something else. So when you hear about when you hear about the nonviolence movement in Birmingham, this wasn't a tactic. This was a, a consciousness. See, you can tell people to go outside and say, "Listen, we're going to go out and we're going to protest, and whatever they do, don't hit them." Back. You can tell people that until somebody gets hit. Back. But if it's a part of your consciousness and your respect for human life and dignity of everybody, then that's it's easy. I never did really. I had that was traumatic. I had no gun. So anyway, I've been a black baby. I've been a black boy. I'm a black man. So I got a little experience of being black. I was born at the University of Alabama mm -hmm. Hospital. And you know, you might be able to see right there, the colored obstetrics ward. And the only reason I was born there, because at the time my daddy worked at the steel mill in Birmingham, so their maternity benefits were tied to the University UAB hospital. Otherwise, you've been at uh, South Highland or uh, Caraway. Which was typically so that was even, but even at the University of Alabama Birmingham Hospital, it was a color obstetric group. So that's the my whole life has begun with being a part of a society where there were things that were in place legally that required almost, but certainly allowed people to treat others differently, and to think that there are certain people who don't deserve the level of care and the quality of life that others enjoy. That's been the story of my life, my parents, and this has been the legacy that many communities of color, black, brown, red, and yellows have always had to be able to handle by being a part of this society. So these aren't people breaking the laws, this is the law. You let, it would, they would probably have locked somebody out if they went in there and, and a, a white woman with her baby and just said, here's a bed, I want to just rest for a while. These aren't just people's attitudes, this is how the laws work. So, coming out of Birmingham, out of that period, and I don't want to get too deep into it because Sarah's story will more than um, adequately address a lot of that. Just a lot of the realities. These people were upholding the law. They weren't breaking it, they were upholding the law that our society had established that were appropriate. And so them trying to maintain separate societies was enforcing the laws of this country that the entire country had acknowledged and accepted. Now it was playing out in the South, particularly in Birmingham, but this was our society. <clears throat> All of these were realities. I went down, Stanley Wallace and I went to, we were going to go down to Mars, we were about nine or ten years old. We were going down the street and my mother came out of the door and she said, hey, come back here, where y'all going? I said, mom, we're going to Mars, we'll get back. She said, no, you're not, get back, get on over the porch. So I walked on back and I said, mom, we got to do something about this, they treating us wrong. She said, listen, when Martin Luther King let his children go into the <laughs> now, my mother died in 2015, the day before Mother's Day, uh, at the age of 92, in her bed, in her in that same house. Okay. Comfortable, peaceful, okay. a beautiful transition. Okay. And we talked about this, uh, many of the incidents throughout those last months of her life. And I reflected back on that incident and I asked her about it. She said, 
you know I respect the Martin Luther King, the movement, and everything. you know what my life has been about with this movement. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't want you to do was to trivialize the value of your life. Because see, for us as kids, that kind of, it almost looked like fun. Mm -hmm. Water, <coughs> cat and mouse with people. And so she knew that we had to make sure that we understood the value of what we were prepared to sacrifice. So I was to continue to honor and love her to this day. Segregated schools, Sarah, we all went to segregated schools. <coughs> Been all the way through high school, we finished, you know, uh, segregated Birmingham school. Every year in September when the school, when the new system started, you would have school books that were passed down after they have been worn out by the kids in the white school. They said you could pass the books down and you could you know, open up and the white kids, it was fun. They would put little racial things in it. So if you were trying to do homework, at the same time dealing with this trauma and the tension and the anxiety of not knowing what's going to be written on the page. While you're studying for arithmetic or mathematics or a science test. So these are the kinds of things. Now, all of this ties into who we are as a country in terms of the health status of our communities. <laughs> so what's interesting on this chart is you may or may have many have probably seen it, but it's to point out that out of all the things that determine your health status, clinical care only represents 10%. 10% is only 10%. And then your genes and DNA and biology Maybe a ten, another 10%. So at best, 20% of your health is determined by, well, you know, we disproportionately focus on access to care and they need to have it, we need to expand Medicaid. And all of those things have valid groundings in it. But 80 to 90% of your health ain't got nothing to do with where you go to the doctor. Or if you even go or whether you can afford medication, and none of those things matter at all when it comes to the 90% almost of what it takes to determine whether you're healthy or not. Your health behaviors, the social economic factors, the environment that you live in are much more important than who your doctor is or whether you got one. So why all of this matters? In 2002, they found that once again, 10% of your death is even determined by access to care. 90%. And mostly it's determined by your zip code. Where you live will determine how long you live. So, when you look at environmental justice, so we think about climate change and we think about uh, global warming, and we think about those things as it relates to the environment. And we have been led to believe that you're not supposed to connect the environmental injustice to environmental racism injustice and make the two. Because it's a predictor of where you live. 50% of the people who live near toxic sites in this country, 56% are communities of color. Ninety-five percent of the claims against the polluters by communities of color have been denied by the EPA. All of the claims always. We have 38 percent high exposure to nitrous oxide. Two times more likely in this country, not Bangladesh, in this country to live without potable water and modern sanitation. So this is not just about a solid, a single conversation about polar bears and glaciers, which are critical to the survival of this planet. But we have to look at what is the connection between all of this and who we are as a society, and certainly who our communities are. So how does it affect us? Right? All of these things play out. And it goes in down into the chain of how determining health outcomes because we look at all of this stuff ends up taking uh, its toll in terms of asthma, bronic, uh, chronic bronchitis, 
diminished lung, fact, lung function, which includes COPD and so many other things, cardiovascular disease, respiratory failure, cancers. It affects our unborn babies. So now just connect the dots and think about the placement of these things and then think about the communities that are affected and then think about some of the recent reporting we've been seeing about this increase in infant mortality and maternal death in black and brown women. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency not to connect these dots. <clears throat> this is, look at this. So this is a gentrified gentrify neighborhood in Philadelphia where row houses are surround, you know, very, very low income. People are, you know, very poverty stricken. Philadelphia's got a 38% poverty rate. Think about that. One of the major cities. It's the poorest major city in America. But yet it's a city who has some of the highest medical institutions and educational institutions in the world. So now the neighborhoods are being gentrified. So the people who, who have left are going to some other place. There are some people who ain't got nowhere to go. So they're around these construction sites and devel housing development, which are basically in neighborhoods that previously housed all kinds of chemicals. up in a very industrial city, a lot of chemical plants. They did uh, uh, some of the top hat makers in the country were at base of 500, uh, you name, I mean, there were just so many industrial plants in it, right? So they were just burying waste and barrels of things. So now, look at the, what's that, where's that dust going? Who, whose children are breathing that dust in? And what are the other chemicals in that, in that, in that stuff, right? So all of this is to continue to reinforce, to understand how a system that we all are part of can be simultaneously while providing all of us with a very good, um, great aspiration, good lives, comfortable living. But we have to always think about the expense that some other people are paying for us to do. And the more we don't know about it, the easier it is not to worry about it. But the more you know, the more you're obligated to make a stand. You've got to make a choice. <clears throat> but there were, um, my figure might be off about a few, but I think there were 93 oil refinery chemical plants in and around Louisiana, New Orleans, doing pre treatment you know, there's a lot of oil fields and they did a lot of oil processing. So they had a lot of chemical plants to use for the oil processing and whatever. Katrina comes, floods out the place. Mm -hmm. They're rebuilding uh, New Orleans. What happened to all them chemicals? Mm -hmm. Washed. <coughs> Who was I just talking to about Louisiana's mortality? Um, right? Yes. We were just talking about Louisiana's as the what? As one of the worst infant mortality rates in the country. Nobody connected dots here. <coughs> Flint, Michigan. Oh. <coughs> I got a water bottle that said white and color, right? See, unless we understand, if you don't know where you've been, you have no idea where you're going. Right. And if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. That's right. So that's why we have to be able to recognize the importance and the significance of Sarah Collins telling her story to understand. So you have a, a mark in the sand to really know how we don't have a compass right now because we don't have any kind of connection to our history. And it's our history. Her sister and three other little girls got killed in that church. But they, they were our sisters. They were our, we are just as affected by it as she is. We just don't understand the connection. And why mental health matters. See, it ain't black or white. One in five. All the people in this country, all the adults, one out of five have a diagnosed mental, I mean, a behavioral health or mental condition in any given year. And, Half of the people in this country actually meet the criteria of whether they've been this diagnosed, whether we've been diagnosed or not. Let me just act like 
I will, I will, I'm trying not to belong, but we all in this together. <laughs> so, okay. So, because I know some people sitting there saying, you know, that's a shame they're like that. I think half of them are like that. No, half of us. <laughs> And the people who say that, you really in the habit. You know, but you know, we could go on and, and just look at these statistics, right? So when we kind of look at health equity, we gotta look at where we are. You know, we gotta look at understanding that the inequities impact social, I mean class and gender and race, yeah. The institutions that are feeding and you know, it's being fed by institutions which then plays out in the neighborhood conditions and the environmental kinds of stuff, including <coughs> racial segregation in Philadelphia and along with some other, there's some of the most segregated cities in this country. Mm -hmm. So when you start to think about how segregated the cities are, then you start to think about where some of these places are located and what, what the environmental conditions are, then you start to look at health patterns, and then you start to hear people walking around trying to sound clueless about you know, we've got to close this gap in health disparities. We've got to do something. I'm going to write a grant for it, or I'm going to... But this ain't rocket science. It really isn't. HIV and AIDS, for example. How do you justify it? HIV AIDS, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, it is clearly now considered a medically chronic condition. Just like diabetes and high blood pressure. You can live a full adult life with the proper medication. But for African Americans, it's still considered an epidemic by the Center for Disease Control. I said African Americans. I didn't say Africans. So because it's easy to say, oh, well that's another country. We don't do that over here. No, I'm talking about the people who right here amongst us, right? So we have to understand how systemic, how institutionalized this whole situation is. Life expectancy. <coughs> Just a quick one. When you look at how African Americans are more likely to die at early ages, after all the information we just covered, right? So when you just compare African Americans to whites in this country. Ten times more tobacco ads in black neighborhoods than in other neighborhoods. Ten times. <clears throat> and for mortality rate, three times more often than white infants. Prostate cancer, two times more often than white males. We talked about HIV AIDS. The infection rate for blacks is eight times higher. Three times more likely to die from a pregnancy-related death than a white man. It's not poverty. They both almost die. Read to Google it. Read their own. Let them listen to their story about what happened and how things happened. So that's how deep this stuff is. It transcends social status, educational level, and income level. <clears throat> that we have allowed something that is, has no biological justification, meaning whatsoever, to be driving major aspects of who we are as people, race. I've been in some places around this country, around the world. I've been in places where they say, "Oh, you're Cuban. Look at you." <laughs> I've been in uh, I've been in like, Kenya, and I was like, "You're Kenyan, brother." <laughs> <laughs> I've been in parts of Mexico. I've been, I'm just saying, it depends on where you are. Don't matter. It's been in Egypt and over the Middle East. Assalamu alaikum, brother. How are you? 
<laughs> but I'm just saying, you have to be able to understand how ludicrous this thing is that we have allowed to actually have take some traction and have even been so careless that we've allowed it to ease into the area where there's science-based issues. Biology, medicine, and technology, and biomedicine, and research. That we let race, which is a total social thing, have something to do to influence outcome. You know, now we talk about Harvard, there's a, um, a whole thing we're doing now looking at this whole thing about gene editing and how there's significant amounts of money being allocated now to go to gene editing that's going to be used to support the argument about education attainment for black and brown children that they'll be able to look at genes and look at the DNA strands and identify the actual strand of DNA that's that directly is responsible for determining whether you will have a high educational attainment. Mm -hmm. So that's going to further, you know, institutionalize this whole inferiority thing, right? And it will determine who can go to what schools. Well, you know, according to your record here, your gene says you really aren't a fit for that school. We're going to let you go over here. Matter of fact, you were going about a train. <laughs> or, or whatever the case may be. So this is, so I'm just saying, we're, and all because race is now being allowed to get into that thing. When at the same time, our DNA, George, 99% of the DNA in everybody's body in this, 99.9% percent of everybody in this room's DNA is identical. 99.9%. .9%. There's only a 0.1% <coughs> difference. And that has to do mostly based on geography, where people are, what the geographical adaptations have been over the years. Some people in climates that require them not to have body hair. <coughs> Some people need to have more hair on their body. Some people need to are so exposed to the sun that they need to have a lot of melanin to make sure that they don't get like radiation poison. That's all that 1% for the most part is represented. But yet we have allowed them, that to really become the 99%, right. the race part, right? Um, isn't it interesting how we got to we this point in history in our country where it's about the 1% and the 99%? <laughs> anyway, I got it. So, uh, Anyway, I just want, you know, to look at how we are living, how we have gone through this recent period of time, in such a short period of time, you know, and now we have the Center for Disease Control has made as an official cause of death, when they have like the top ten causes of death and all that, they got to add something new that's a new way to die, and it's called legal intervention. There's so many black boys of color being killed, <coughs> that they have made it a medical cause of death, legal and <coughs> For black boys between the age of 15 and 19, ninth leading cause of death. Between the age of 20 and 24, it's the 10th leading cause of death. CDC did that in 2000. That ain't mine. I didn't make that up. I'd like to take credit, but I didn't. <laughs> PTSD. So you have any idea what the rate of ho youth homicides and legal intervention in this country? How many little children wake up and the next day and say, where's Mr. Glenn? Oh, he got killed last. Over there, right there. See what the teddy bear, the little monument, the camel stuff. So you got a six-year-old kid. Come on, baby, get back and better go to school now. This little kid is like traumatized. He going to school, still in a fog, and then two weeks later, the guy who killed Mr. Glenn, somebody got him. And he's the little kid who knew both of them. So what he's gonna, what is he supposed to do with that? But be traumatized, which is why there's an 83% rate of lifetime trauma exposure, <coughs> particularly African Americans. We got a rate just among African Americans is 43 percent right now. PTSD. So 
like I talk to a lot of my colleagues, and I have to remind them, none of them have to ever think in the morning when they see their boy goes to school that that may be the last time they see him. Not because he's a bad kid, not because any of this stuff, because place matters. And race matters. So we have to have to talk to our kids. You don't have to tell you. You have to say, son, listen, you get stopped. Even if you know you didn't do anything, do this, do that. Don't ever do that. Don't, don't, don't. Conversations that are unimaginable for a significant portion of the population in this country. Unimag unthinkable. They disband the police department before they allowed themselves to have to do that to their child just for them to go out to school or go out to play. They're like, we don't need no police there. If they require us to do it, no. But we're subjected to got to deal with it, right? So place matters. Just as uh, Robert Wood Johnson has a study, he looked at a lot of quite a few cities. I know they did uh, in California, they did Sacramento and LA, I think. I'm not sure of the rest of the city. But all over the country, just looked at the maps and looked at life expectancy, right? So just five miles in Philadelphia, your life expectancy. 20 years within the city limits of Philadelphia, you'll live 20 years more. Just by living in the same, and writing in the same, breathing the same air, drinking the same water. What's going on? I don't get it. So we're not talking about equality. Yeah, everybody can go to this school. Everybody has the right to go and eat at this restaurant. You can drink out of whatever water fountain you have. But we're talking about equity. Right? Because everybody can't go to the wall when it's equal. You still are not having your full participation. But see, I always take it a step further, because I'm into liberation, right? Oh, see, because the first thing is, because the first thing is, I didn't have the wall anyway. That's right. That's right. Why well, didn't got the wall? Right? Because as long as there's a wall over there, even while you fight for equity, the people who got advantages, so well, I'm just going to get some more milk crazy. I'll just be real high. So then that's why we got the word on liberation. So we got to eliminate the barriers that prevent us from being who we could be, enjoying the life that we're supposed to be enjoying, enjoying and sharing and loving each other the way we are designed. We don't, we're like, they just say you only use 2% of your brain or some, I heard some statistic like that, right, in terms of what's unused. In our capacity to love, we might even barely be at a 1% level because we got so we got walls and barriers. I ain't talking about nothing down by Tijuana and, and, and uh, El Paso. That's nothing. I'm talking about who we are, the walls we have extended. And those are the walls that prevent us from seeing each other, from seeing the hurt in each other, from understanding our, our, each other's pain, understanding our humanity, who we are as people. And to think that no child has the right to not enjoy every privilege that my child has. No child has the right to not have every opportunity that my child has. And see, some of us are willing to relinquish some of our privilege just to ensure that that happens. And the reason it don't happen is because most of us in this country, in this society, aren't willing to relinquish some of that privilege. That's the reality of it. So you can plead guilty, or you can plead not guilty, but you can't plead that there's no problem. Because <laughs> there's a problem. And I repeat it again, until the lion gets his own storyteller. The story of the hunt will always glorify the hunt. So that's why the storyteller, to help us to understand the history, the accurate history of what happened September the 15th, 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama, 28 days after the I had a dream. Was it less than 28? 28 days after Martin Luther King did the I Have a Dream. I see a country one day where my children and the black children and the white children and 
we still hold 28 days later, sticks of dynamite were placed under the steps of the 16th Street Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. So today, Sarah Rudolph Collins is going to talk to you and share with you her story about being a witness to that. And tell you exactly what happened, how it happened. So what you're going to see is a, and here is a story about courage to want to continue to live. You're going to see a, and hear a story about wanting to continue to find a way to love yourself. You're going to see and hear somebody who can talk firsthand about the ability to find the compassion find forgiveness and love in her heart. Those lessons aren't ultimately the ones that we all keep <coughs> You might as well just forget. But this is the only pathway for us to become who it is we're supposed to be. So may I just have the honor and the pleasure of asking you to please welcome the honor and the dignity that she deserves. Let's go build on it. Please stand up and please welcome Sarah Collins. Walk from 7th Street 
Street, the 16th Street. And while we were walking, my sister Jane had this little purse, and we were throwing it and laughing all the way to church. And when we arrived to church, we went on down in the basement. Our son's school was in the basement, Eddie and I. And Jane's um, class was upstairs. She came on down to the basement with us this day. Um, Son of the freshman up. She said, make sure y'all go to y'all class. But we didn't go, we stayed in the ladies' lounge since we were late anyway. So while we was in the ladies' lounge, I could, I started looking out the window at the door, uh, waiting for the class to turn out. And while I was looking, I seen the least back now. Cynthia Weston, Carol Robson. They came into the ladies' lounge and they went on to the other side where the stalls were after they had spoken to us. And when they came out the stall, they were together. Denise was in front. So when she came out, she walked over to my sister Addie and asked Addie to tie the sash on her dress. And I was standing across from them at the sink. And when she asked Addie to tie the sash, we started looking. And when she did her hands like that to tie it, boom! And all I could say was, Jesus, Addie, Addie, Addie. But she didn't answer. So what I thought, I thought that they had ran over to the uh, other side with the Sunday school girl room. And all of a sudden, I heard someone say, somebody bombed the 16th Street Church. And his voice was so clear, and though he was in there with us, but right where he was standing, it blew a big crater by the window. And by the window, there was some stairs coming down. And that's where they had hit the bomb under the stairs. And one of the people told me, who he was that son, his name was Samuel Wilkinson. I met him later on in the year, and he said that was him. He had uh, come from his class to come down the steps to uh, investigate to see what had happened when he heard the noise. And when he began to take the steps to come down, the bomb had blew the stab away. So he just jumped down from the uh, on top of the building, and he, when he, when he uh, landed, we looked inside the, the uh, room and into the hole, and he saw me standing there. And he came in, and I, I could move simply because I couldn't see. So he came and put me in his arm and brought me out, and the ambulance was already standing outside waiting. So they rushed me over to the Hillman Hospital. Now it's the uh, uh, University Hospital. So when I arrived, the, the lady, uh, nurse or whoever it was, she said, you, you, you would have to uh, lay on the cot because the eye doctor is not in. So while I laid there, my sister Jane came in. And I asked her, where is that? And she said that Ed had heard of that. So I said, okay. So later they rushed me on up the steps to operate on my eyes. And when I came from the recovery, my mother was upstairs waiting for me. And that's when I found out that all of the girls who were in the bathroom, ladies down with me, they all was killed. I was the only survivor. So, uh, I kept the bandage on my eye, and I just, I, would, I, I couldn't do nothing but just wonder why those girls were killed. They didn't do anything but uh, be killed in church. So I just cried. I cried all night long, just wondering why. So uh, in a week time, they took the bandages off my eyes, and the doctor asked, what, what do I see? My, my uh, 
young ass that I see in real life. He said, what do you see out of your right eye? I said, I can't see anything, so I was blinded in my right eye. And uh, I stayed in the hospital for uh, a couple of months. And before I was released, the doctor told my mother to bring me back in February because they was going to have to remove my right eye. If they didn't remove it, I would go blind in my left eye. So uh, I went on back to school. You know, at that time, I didn't get any counseling or anything. And I was just really in a bad condition. I was so traumatized. And I remember when I would hear anything loud, back there during that time, we would have uh, those cars that would back back, make all that noise. And when I hear a car back back, I would just jump all over. Because I still had that, that trauma in me. And uh, they didn't need counseling. I didn't get any counseling. And I was just at the age of 12 years old when that happened. So I was just so traumatized for a long time. Oh, yeah. And uh, the teachers, and they was uh, real nice, but I, I just feel like some of the children were nice. So I had a, had a teacher named Miss Rouse, and she was my sewing teacher. <coughs> and um, she would always, she asked me, to do a stitch one day, and I didn't get the stitch right, so she hit me in my back. So I just told her, I said, you don't hit me in my back, my mama don't hit me in my back. So I just walked off the school ground and I went home to get my mother. And when I came back to school with her, I didn't have any more trouble out here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. so my mother, she got to straighten out. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I went on. I finished elementary school and I finished high school. And I thought the, the children didn't know when I went to high school. I thought the kids didn't know that. I was in a bond, and I was glad that, you know, the school was going to have different children going there. But I asked my husband later on, we was in the same class, I asked him, did anybody know that I was in a bond? He said, everybody did. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I was so traumatized and I was so nervous, I was nervous for years, for years. But uh, the people that bombed these on uh, 16th Street Baptist Church, uh, uh, Robert Chambers, he was, uh, they found him guilty in year 77. And two more bombs, uh, Thomas Blanton <coughs> and, and uh, Bobby Frank Cherry. They found him guilty, it took 39 years to bring them to court. And the only one that's living now is Blanton. He's in the St. Clair County Jail. But all the others, other, uh, they, they live their life. They live a good life, but I just hate it so bad that they put, put a bomb in the church. And the, and the girls, they've been living since they live their life. But anyway, I had to be with them for what they did. Because at first, when I was young, I was angry. I was angry at that. Quiet, but bombing the church and killing those girls. You know, there wasn't a good reason to kill, kill young people because of their color. And I was mad for a long time. So I think it, was, it took me until I got <coughs> 39 years old to really overcome that. And I just thank God that I didn't continue to hate them for what they did. Because, you know, the devil can use people to do things like that. And I know that 
I am the spirit of the devil, so I just want to forgive me.
knows where you're not. But if you're clear about your destination, it's easier to tell when you're going in the right direction, right? And that means that you'll know when you encounter people and resources and other institutions and that data or whatever it may be in the process, you'll know how this is useful. Even though it's not applicable at the moment, you'll say, I need to hold on to this. But um, I, I got to, what, that, that presentation was a lifetime worth of personal experiences and just knowledge, relationships, you know, so, yeah, but the key is, just know where you're going and you'll be clear about it. You'll be good. I have a question for Sarah. Um, so I heard you say that it took you about 39 years to forgive. My question to you is, how long did it take you to own your story? I think uh, it took a while before I started. I didn't want to talk about it. I think it was within about uh, the year of uh, 2000 when I started really going out and talking about it. Uh, it was something that I just couldn't bring myself to talk about. I was still uh, on the same topic as I was trying to think about it. And I didn't want to be sitting down until I did <clears throat> just kind of on that same thread, just um, how you found the word of forgiveness. What was that? Just a little bit about it, because I think that could be helpful. I'm not feeling real happy right now. I need a little. You're not going to hurt nobody, are you? Well, <laughs> <laughs> if we talk forgiveness, I'll be okay. <laughs> I began to think that it wasn't all. Caucasian people that put the bomb in the church. And that's the way I was feeling. I, I just didn't want to uh, be around. But I began to think about it a lot. I just had to start thinking a lot of the life that I didn't really just want to pick up and clean it up. And I was just very much a part of the church. And I was very much a part of the church. Um, what were your feelings about a movie being made about your story? Did you feel like it was told correctly or did, were you happy or did you feel like it was kind of exploiting the issue and the story of your life? You had to go there, didn't you? Well, it was good enough And um, Stop and let that resonate. As a matter of fact, let it marinate. Marinate that overnight and it's all something bitter. Just really let it hit that right Because think about what we now understand to be victim compensation funds, right? And think about somebody in the World Trade Center all right. being denied compensation. All right. Boston Marathon. You can, it's unimaginable. We wouldn't tolerate that as a society if we heard somebody say that the people in that trade center mm -hmm. were not going to be there and the firefighters, those first responders. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. So we got to put this in context. So that's why if you don't know, uh, if you don't remember know where you've been, <laughs> you're doomed to repeat it, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying we have to understand history. So you got to think about how significant. Now, 
But from the other point of view, they weren't good. If they had to, if they acknowledged this, then they had John Taylor, Paolo de Uzo, they had a whole um, uh, Virgin, what's Virgin mm -hmm. where? Virgin where? John Rock, John Rock, John, the other two little boys that got, those two little other little boys that got killed that night at the church. They were killed that same day. Right? <coughs> So I'm just saying, so you got to understand a system that would support saying, you know what, we're not going down that road. So wait a minute, are you saying we're not worthy as the people at the marathon, across the marathon? What, what's the, what is the message that we're supposed to walk away with? Right. What is the message? So that's why I'm saying it's important to hear her story so that we can understand who is it that we want to be as a society. See, if you don't know, it's easy to say, well, gee, that's such a shame, Sarah. I'm so sorry to hear that happen to you. I'm going to keep you in my prayer. But if you know the deal, and if you really know the reality, then you have to stop and say, how will we make sure that don't happen again? How will the next tragedy, because there's going to be some more. Right? How will we make sure that this the Sarah's in the future, and her family, and the children she can't have because of that incident. <clears throat> How are we going to make sure we protect them? That's really what, you know, what it's about. And that's why, you know, Sarah, could, listen, she might have been a, uh, being the head of some school of nursing right now. With no stretch of imagination, but she ain't gonna say it, but her and Annie were smart girl. We went to Hill School, Burnett, Brunetta C. Hill School on 3rd Street in Smithfield, Birmingham, Alabama. They were smart. All everybody in that school was smart. Condoleezza Rice was in our in my class. And she wasn't the smartest girl in the class. With <laughs> <laughs> all due respect, she's still my friend. She's my friend. And I mean that sincerely. And I had to let one a little girl that um you know Jackie Kelly? Yeah. You know her sister? She had a sister named May Kelly. I didn't make Kelly. She was in my class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this woman got pregnant when she went to, between the summer going from the eighth grade to the night, starting high school. Mm -hmm. Dropped out of high school and had a two or three more babies. Mm -hmm. And raised those babies. And as they got old enough, and when we first, when the oldest one got in the eighth grade, she started doing homework with her. She finished high school with them children and got her GED. Wow. Went on and got her R and became an RN. Wow. Right? Was head, head and shoulders above anything kind of and Condoleezza kind of wouldn't be that she would not deny that. But I'm just saying these were we, these are lives and futures and families that were just extinguished and snuffed out. These are not just Spike Lee movies. Which ain't that good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was just kidding. Spike, my boy. <laughs> but seriously. My <laughs> Ricky, pray for me. We'll see how they help. I need help, brother. <laughs> but anyway, so I just want you to understand what this, you know, this is a Black History Month program, and I am so enormously we're indebted and grateful for it. Um, being Brios, who just had the fortitude, the vision, or, and just the determination that she wanted to see this happen. Because it did, she didn't have to do this. She did not have to do this. So I'm, we are grateful that this has been able to happen. Interesting question because I saw that you used the social determinants of health. Uh, interesting question. Now, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's a setup. You know, you're ready for the Bob and Weave on that. Oh, no. so, but I do notice that you don't use the word racism and you don't talk about structural racism. So, one of the things that I found in my most recent research is that when we talk about the social determinants of health model, structural racism, institutionalized racism, all those systems of oppression are not identified in that model. 
So how do we account for all of these variations that we see? But you know, that's, uh, that's a great, that's an excellent question. Um, I struggle every time I do a presentation. And, the, and I don't struggle about that, trust me. What I struggle with is saying, the topic is so huge, and there's so much, I can just do a, I do, and I do them. Presentations are just about looking at the racism involved in the inf infant and maternal mortality piece. There's a whole nother racism around end of life issues, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There's a whole, I mean, it's, I, so it's all kinds of stuff. So I struggle with saying, okay, Sharon, I gotta do this program, how we're gonna, you know, time, blah, 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 what I'm gonna put into it. But I think you make a very interesting and a very important point to, to lose sight of. And so because what I was attempting to do was really kind of um, address the issues uh, that you raise about institutional racism by just looking at the manifestations of it. Mm -hmm. Because here's one of the things is, I remember when, I, when this guy was pestering me in a very kind way. We had well, all good intent. Every time I went somewhere, he was like, hey man, I want to ask you a question. I'll be at the supermarket, the gas station, the donut shop, everywhere. Listen, man, what do you think about it? He always had something to say, you know. And I remember one time I was in line at this cafe getting ready to check out, and he came up behind me. He said, hey man, I'm glad to see you. I have some questions for you. And I said, you know, you're about to, you know, I really appreciate seeing you because there's always the most idiotic, <coughs> the most nonsensical kind of stuff and the brilliance that you must have to come up with that. And so I went through this whole day with this guy and he was like, thank you so much. Nobody's ever complimented me. He didn't realize <laughs> so, so I say all that to say sometimes what you have to do is because we have those barriers and all of us have them that you have to be able to figure out how you can call a thing a thing without calling a thing a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's to the so point where you, you know it. You know you Sarah, this is going to take a second. So, I'm <laughs> uh, embarrassed. No matter how long it takes, it will only be a second. I promise you. So, she uh, embarrassingly mentioned this Harvard program. I'm a fellow, I have a fellowship at Harvard Medical School and recently bioethics, research bioethics, right? So, um, there's a cohort of 12 people, as you mentioned in the introduction, I'm only African American and a whole bunch of things. <laughs> so anyway, we have the sessions and the leader of this discussion on this particular week was the woman who's a very powerful bioethicist in terms of notoriety, respect, and blah, blah, blah. She made her presentation and she finished. We had an open discussion like this. There's only 12 of us, so it's a very small group. She started talking and people were making comments and had a little two cents and giving their opinions about the topic. And so we finished and I'm packing my stuff here ready to go out of the room and get to the airport, go back to Philly. And she said, uh, Glenn, I need to, can I speak to you for a second? So I said, sure. I I'm innocent. I just walked back up to her and she came, as I was walking her, she came to me and I thought she was walking a little fast. Here. So I'm, I'm almost like went into my Spider-Man radar thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, something ain't right about this. So she came all the way up into my face. Almost, you know, I was like, girl, where I come from, you don't do that. But anyway, I gave her a bit. Long story short, she came up and she said, do we have a problem? And I said, excuse me? She said, Every time there's an interaction, that when you and I have to interact, it's like I feel like something's not right. I said, I don't know what that is. I go through too much of a sacrifice to be here in Boston every Friday, no matter where I am in the country. I got to get to Boston by Friday morning. So this is important. I'm coming here to benefit from this, and I'm going to get everything there is. If you can think of something that interferes, let me know. She says, you know, I'm, I didn't even know how you would take it, because I had to get that off. I had to let you know that there, I didn't feel comfortable about it. But uh, I'm going to think about whatever we can think of, come up with some solutions. She said, but you know what might be helpful in the meantime? Maybe when you have a comment or have something to say, maybe you should pose it in the form of a question. So, I don't know about y'all, where I come from, that means whenever you got something to say, don't act like you know anything, don't have no authority, no opinion. Just be in the room like you're just here to learn. So, 
I backed out of that one, right? <laughs> I mean, that because if it went any further, it wasn't going to be pretty, right? So I had enough sense to know. And plus, Hawk, they got some security. And <laughs> But what it did, though, I realized how difficult and how much pushback and how defensive people are about the same stuff that I just talked about. Right? Yeah. See, so I had, a, I had to do a major project, a major lecture at medical school in my life. And I decided. And I would take the lecture I was going to do based on the actual, <clears throat> some real serious ethical cases involving some situations that were real, that were racist, steeped in racism, mm -hmm. institutional racism. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it as a fictional story. Mm -hmm. So when I got up and read, I read it as though I was reading, doing a book reading kind of thing. And mm -hmm. half of the room was in tears, crying. Wow. And the same person who told me that I need to ask an informal question, she said, then that's the most brilliant thing I've ever heard. You, you have to turn that into a novel. That's a novel. That's not just, oh, and I've already sent it to this person who's going to publish it in this journal and blah, 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 blah. Right? So that's why, my brother, that's why I said, you got to know where you're going. And you don't know when you're going the right way. And we can't allow ourselves to get caught up in the traps. None of us. We can't get caught up in the other people trapped in that, that they know. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They said, well, you didn't use the word African. Did you say, or, what, is it African American or is it black? Mm -hmm. See, I'm not getting caught up into that. That's your issue. Yeah, I'm not looking at the facts. I got facts here, right? That's so good. I mean, are you people colored? Or are you black? Or are you Negro? I can't keep up with this thing. You know, can I touch your hair? You know, just, I <laughs> okay, all right, I'll back, I'll back. So he was about, uh, are we okay? Did it go for anybody? Yes, sir. All right. You were privileged to have this presentation and to get this wonderful perspective. Does that mean I got a shot at the jacket? No, you can't have a jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I don't realize this, but why before this evening, I thought that would have been. We have to turn the army, so I said, well, that's you. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I'm sorry. My story is, how much of this history, these stories, and this experience of this population has been written out of the history books in our educational <clears throat> system? What is going on there? That is pure racism. There we are. Absolutely. Thank you. He couldn't have said it better. And that's why. That's why. That is why. But see, that's why. Until you know her story and you know it's the accurate story, it's not filtered by anybody else. You don't even know how to even how to put it in that context. Secondly, and equally as important is that's why her book is getting ready to come out. Uh, but you know, it was just uh, behind the publisher uh, was behind uh, their they the off deadline. The fifth little girl is uh, um, always want to say African World Press. That's it. It's African World Press. That's the publisher. Uh, It's an excellent. It's an excellent history book. It's an excellent. Uh, it's a great a, a novel. The story is unbelievable, and it's also a great teaching tool of all for all ages. It's a great gift. It's something that I, you know. I'm just saying, and I ain't sitting here trying to. I can think of some other things to sell that I, I can get everybody to buy, but I just think that you need to know that this is something that is value creating that we can all support and that we should all permeate. Because see the reality is this room is basically right now comprised of some of the who are going to be the most powerful people in this country in different capacities. So first and foremost you've got the opportunity to be directly informed by this system and this history in the context of what your profession and your disciplines are.
So as you move on, you'll be able to. Because see, she ain't going to be everywhere. And one of y'all going to be somewhere, and somebody will say, that was such a shame about, I saw the uh, Selma movie, and I saw the little girls were just going up the steps to church. And all of a sudden, the bar, I couldn't believe it. He was like, hey, 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 hey. That was not accurate. That's right. I talked to the lady who, she was there. That was not out. That was some Hollywood stuff. Right. It wasn't going up, you know. So I'm just saying little things like that. So that's why I'm saying until the lion gets the story done, the hunter can always tell the story. You can. It's got, you ain't got nothing to go against it, so it's going to be what he wants it to be. But Sarah's book will be another kind of opportunity for us to be able to permanently be able to, to have that kind of history accurately told. And see, because when we were in, uh, growing up in Birmingham, they had, and when they taught us history, we, had, we learned they taught Alabama history. The states, I don't know, they, they learned about the state. They taught Alabama history. They didn't even have a civil war in, in Alabama history. <laughs> they had chapters on, on General Robert E. Lee as a you know, heroic general in general, right? But they didn't talk about that civil war. When Gone with the Wind came out, they had to edit, there's a reason they have an intermission in it because they had to re-edit the film to take out the part to be shown down south where they burned Atlanta to the ground, where Sherman uh, burned Atlanta to the ground. So I'm just saying, who controls the power will control the history. If you don't know any better, so that's why you got to know the history of this stuff that's critical. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yes, well, I just had an observation since we're talking about um, health determinants, etc. And I've had some unique uh, experiences listening to stories. And I used to work for a really well-known medical school here in California and visited their alums all over the country. And um, I was going to be visiting some in the South and um, would check out first, you know, to think this person is interested to talk to me, etc., etc. One of them was one of the early African-American students that was a surgeon and had graduated from there. And they said, oh, we won't want to talk to you. We didn't have a great experience here and things like that. So I was determined to go talk to him. <laughs> and it was the most interesting conversation, talk about stories, uh, ever had. Because he was always sent to the East Orlando Hospital, where they had all the difficult shootings and everything else. You know, no matter what he did in any other field, that's aspect of medicine. That's where he was sent. And he would have to deal with these really, really difficult surgeries. And he would see other doctors walk away and just can't handle this. And he would try and find a new way to fix the situation. And I thought that was just the most beautiful testimony one could hear because, you know, he wasn't exactly rising up the ladder, yeah. so to speak, right? But yeah. So but, see, but that, that goes once again to you got to know where you're going. He knew what he knew what he wanted to do, what kind of difference he wanted to make, and all of those types of things. So, Grandpapa told me, don't ever let somebody else's behavior determine who you are. You've got to determine who you are, and then you don't matter about the noise around you. You get to know where you're going. So, anybody? So if we don't have any other questions, I do have some um, just tokens of our appreciation, Sarah. This is for you. Johnson. Um, I'm just saying, so it was really a, 
All of those, all of those challenges, all of those difficulties, all of the painful stuff, right? We were still receiving the nurturing that was necessary collectively as a community that instilled in us the stuff. Because see, the experience that Sarah went through, she only is able to stand here with the grace and dignity she is because it was something your mama put in you. And the, the experiences, all of the challenges and those trials and tribulations, Continue to beat us up in life until we have to dig deep enough in there. But ain't nothing there. If ain't nobody put nothing in there. You ain't coming up with nothing. But there was something down in there deep enough that would actually she was able to come up with the love, the forgiveness, the dignity, the grace, and all of the things that have continued to sustain her throughout. So we all have been benefited by, by just being a part of that. You know, George left high school, left Parker High School. In 1969, May of 19, June of 1969, and uh, before you could blink two or three eyes, he was over in Vietnam. Oh, wow. 17 years old. Probably, had you ever been out of Birmingham before that, Joy? I never left Birmingham. <laughs> you see what I mean? And the day he said there by the grace of God, because a lot of them didn't make it back. Right. And the song that came back, they don't even know they're back. Come on. <laughs> That's right. Show you, buddy. Yes. So we got to just understand what we're talking about here and how we, how we got to be careful. We can't be so dismissive of our history and who we are. We got to talk about the whole story, not just his story. We got to talk about our story, all of the, all of the stories. Understand, you can't be because otherwise you'll get caught up in a trick. And Rick, I swear I'm gonna set up after this. I tell you, <laughs> listen, this is important because we have to let, we have to be careful who we allow to dictate, dictate the conversation. Mm -hmm. See, we have to stop and think about other people determining that we need that the most important thing in healthcare is access to healthcare. Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody insuring that there are resources to adequately address the homelessness in this country. Ain't nobody dealing with the resources adequately necessary to integrate medical and behavioral health like it sh should be. Ain't nobody talking about making sure that oral health and all of these things are tied together if there's one. Instead, the payment model is still determined in this country by each of those disciplines having totally separate stuff. So. No, but that's a powerful lobbying, lobbying thing. So we got to be careful about that. And if we don't know better, we'll never do better. So that's why this whole thing is important to understand the trauma, to make sure we ought to get up. This should, we should walk out of here more sensitive to understanding what children are being with firsthand witnesses to and expected to behave and to be normal in classes and in daycare and in at the dinner table. And when they're not, we got a whole system that says, well, we got something for them. Mm -hmm. Bring them on down. Oh, he can't go back. I'm sorry, you're not suitable. Your son can't, he's not, he won't fit in the classroom. We got to find an alternative for him. Excuse me? So just understand that there's a method to all of this that directly is relevant to what each of you are doing with your lives and the commitments you made. And so I'm just, um, thank you. And I do want to say, we're going to, Sarah's going to... Sit, sit, yeah, turn it all around. Okay. That's, honey, can you help me? We're just going to set up so folks can come up and say hi to Sarah. But I don't want you to get up yet because Glenn writes some amazing books. So this is Information is the Best Medicine, A Guide to Navigating Your Health Care. It's very, and he did this so that the community would understand. So this isn't, you know academic, although it's academic and based on fact and research, it's written so that folks can understand. And then she did, he did the same thing with La Información es la Mejor Medicina in Spanish. So we've got Spanish and English. Some of you have little numbers under your seats. So you might have a little piece of paper under your seat. There should be. And we've also got some posters. So if you can't. There will be 